your inner Neanderthal. I ran across a, uh, uh, an, an article that recommended that uh, there were effects of Neanderthal DNA on modern humans, and uh, it's entitled that. And a sub-study, er, a subtitle is, The New Study Reveals How ne Neanderthal DNA in the Genomes of Present-Day British People Influences Their Traits. So, uh, it's relatively recent, and uh, I thought it would be worthwhile looking at the uh, popularized version, at the actual article, and then thinking about it. Um, that's uh, on the right is a Neanderthal skull. You'll notice that um, the f brow slopes back just a little bit more, that there are heavier brow ridges, um, but it looks pretty much the same except that the uh, brain case actually is slightly larger, which means that there is more room for um, a brain. Uh, which presumably means they had larger brains, which is interesting and not the usual that you hear about Neanderthals. Um, people of Caucasian descent have within their genome small amounts of D Neanderthal DNA. Take that with a grain of salt. Actually, probably very large amounts of Neanderthal DNA, as we'll see, but previous studies have shown this Ancient DNA may influence a person's health, but a new study in the American Journal of Human Genetics today, at October 5, reveals that the effects of one's inner Neanderthal are even more wide-reaching. Um, this study is looking at a huge co cohort and at a different set of traits than have been directly analyzed before, many of which are non-medical, says evolutionary and computational geneticist uh, Tony Capra of Vanderbilt University, who was not involved in the current study, but performed a similar analysis of Neanderthal-influenced medical traits last year. And what's really exciting is that even though this, there was this broader scope of traits th that was considered, they point uh, to effects of Neanderthal DNA on similar systems to what's been seen previously. After the 2013 discovery that Neanderthals interbred with the ancestors of modern Europeans, they were supposed to be a separate line, right? Well, maybe not. Says Janet Kelso of the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, one of the questions that came up was, what effect does that have on the genomes of people today? What effect does it have on their phenotypes? To answer such a question, Kelso explains, she, by the way, is the author of the study that we'll be looking at, you need really large sample sizes, as well as both phenotype and genotype data. That kind of data really hasn't been available until the last couple of years, she says. Um, they didn't think they could get DNA from Neanderthals. And those data sets that are available tend to be based on medical phenotypes, meaning you couldn't look at normal phenotypes like height or weight, when you, what you eat, and the color of your hair. Uh, reason being that, you know, if you've got some kind of disease, well, how do you know that your height, for example, isn't affected by the disease? That all changed in 2015 when the UK Biobank released to qualified researchers data on 50, pardon me, 500,000 volunteers who had gone, uh, undergone genotyping, answered detailed and wide-ranging questionnaires about themselves and were having their health monitored long-term. You can join that, I guess, if you live in the UK. When we saw that the data from the UK Biobank was becoming available, we were really excited because this huge mine to, to hunt uh, relationships da uh, out of. Kelso and her team first narrowed the sample to include only the 1,012, 338, pardon me, 112,338 individuals with white European ancestry. Um, they're going after native, so to speak, although in the British Isles, a native is a loose term. Um, 
and then use these data to tease out which traits are influenced by Neanderthal genetic variants. The traits they identified, including those that affect hair color, skin color, skin tanning and burning, sleeping patterns, mood, and tobacco use. Did Neanderthals use tobacco? Mm. Um, for example, being a self-described night owl and being pro prone to daytime napping were both traits positively influenced by Neanderthal variants, as were loneliness, low mood, and smoking. Genetic loci associated with having red hair were found to be devoid of Neanderthal variants. Take that with a grain of salt for what it's worth. We're going to come to that suggesting red-headed Neanderthals were either rare or non-existent. The new study also supports Capra and colleagues' previous observations that Neanderthal variants are associated with sun-induced skin lesions, mood disorders, and smoking. That traits such as skin color, sunburning, and sleep patterns were identified by the analysis might be explained by the Neanderthals' adaptations to life at more northern latitudes suggests Capra. But for other traits, he notes, determining how the effects seen in present-day peoples might once have affected Neanderthals themselves is one of our crucial challenges. For example, he says, of course, Neanderthals were not smoking. So why are they so susceptible? What would really help to generate a better picture of what Neanderthals were like, says Capra, is to have more high-quality DNA samples from Neanderthal specimens. And as we'll see, that's a, an understatement. He is therefore very excited about another paper published today in Science, also by Kel Kelso and a different group of colleagues, but which is used in the paper that we're going to be discussing. The team reports the high resolution sequencing of a new female Neanderthal genome extracted from a bone from, found in a Croatian cave. Being an estimated 50,000 years old, this specimen is close in time to when Neanderthals are thought to have interbred with humans. I'm skipping on down, I'm not going to read the whole thing, of course. The sequencing of this new genome also represents a real technical advantage, advance, says anthropologist John Hawkes of the University of Wisconsin. Until now, the only high-quality Neanderthal DNA has come from a cave in Denisova in... Is that Denisova? I'm not sure. Uh, in Siberia, where DNA is well preserved because of the freezing temperatures year round, Hawks explained. But the new genome came from bones in a more temperate cave where DNA preservation is suboptimal. That raises an interesting question. How do you get good quality DNA from a bone in Croatia? Um, at 50,000 years old when the half-life of DNA is considerably less than that, according to our measurements. And those of you who may remember how long can DNA last, we looked at the MOAs in New Zealand and found that, uh, that uh, there was quite a bit less uh, DNA in the older specimens. Uh, but apparently after 5,000 years, it, it smooths out. Sort of like amino acid racemization. Anyway, um, well, what about the original article? Because, you know, you really be careful about trusting the, uh, the press releases. So it, uh, by the way, is able to be found on the internet, so you can check it out if you want to. Um, and the abstract reads, assessing the genetic contribu contributions of Neanderthals to non-disease phenotypes in modern humans has been difficult because of the absence of large cohorts for which common phenotype information is available. So we have no clue what makes you tall or short or uh, blonde or dark haired, blue eyes, whatever. Well, actually we're starting to get a handle on blue eyes. Um, Using baseline phenotypes collected for 112,000 individuals by the UK Biobank, we, now can, we can now elaborate on previous findings that identified associations between signatures of positive selection on Neanderthal DNA and various modern human traits, but not any specific phenotypic consequences. 
that is. Uh, you know, we kind of figured out a little bit. Now we have data that will help us more in, try in terms of finding out what uh, Neanderthals actually um, gave us and, and uh, kind of in the process what they m probably looked like. <coughs> Pardon me? This baseline phenotype, can you explain that term to us? Baseline phenotype? What were they, uh, which part of the back. DNA were they looking at there? Um, Collected for color. Well, they're looking at uh, pretty much whole genome data, specific parts of it, but I mean, it's basically they were, uh, they were finding um, differences between Neanderthals and um, a certain African tribe, which kind of kept to itself, and then uh, but we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. And then they, and then they took that data and checked it out on modern British people. Why British? Because they have this registry, that's why. The same part of the genome. And, then, and what? The same part of the genome. The same part of the genome, right. And you know nowadays you can do that kind of thing. In fact, if you want to, you can you know order stuff like Twenty Three and Me and get and find out, you know, what part of you came from Scandinavia and what part of you came from whatever. Here we show that the Neanderthal DNA affects skin tone and hair color. It actually doesn't much. Height, sleeping patterns, mood, and smoking status in present-day Europeans. Interestingly, multiple DNA alleles at different loci continue, contribute to skin and hair color in present day Europeans, and these Neanderthal alleles contribute to both lighter and darker skin tones and hair color, suggesting that Neanderthals themselves are most likely variable in these traits. So, didn't really contribute. It's just, they're like us, and some are darker and some are lighter, and no big deal. Um, introduction. Interbreeding between Neanderthals and early modern humans has been shown to contrib have contributed about 2% Neanderthal DNA to the genomes of present day non Africans. That gets translated into you are 2% Neanderthal. Um, for what it's worth reading elsewhere, um, uh, East Asians are about 3% Neanderthal. And uh, Africans are 0% Neanderthal, although some of that may be an artifact of how they're, uh, how they're uh, uh, doing the check to begin with, but, uh, but I don't think much of it is. I think that there is actually more close relationship between Neanderthals and Europeans and uh, uh, Chinese and their relatives than there is between Neanderthals and Africans. Well, Neanderthals are found in Europe and Asia. Um, this Neanderthal DNA has apparently had both positive and negative effects. Well, that's true about everybody's DNA and their parents, right? Uh, together with the rapid decrease in Neanderthal ancestry after introgression, for those of you wondering what introgression means, insertion of Neanderthal DNA into uh, people of European or in this particular case European because they're deliberately excluding everybody else but um, it would apply to Asian as well ancestry um, so it's basically intermarriage or inter uh, uh, reproduction whatever you want to call it uh, the depletion of Neanderthal DNA around functional genomic elements in present-day human genomes suggests that a large fraction of Neanderthal alleles are deleterious in modern humans. Well, maybe that's why they didn't uh, survive as long. I don't know. However, recent studies have also identified a number of introgressed Neanderthal alleles that have increased in frequency in modern humans and that may, might contribute <coughs> excuse me, to um, genetic adaptation to new environments. Adaptive variants in genes related to immunity, skin and hair pigmentation, and metabolism have been identified. So it's not all bad. 
The majority of Neanderthal alleles in the genomes of people today are, however, not strongly adaptive and therefore present in low frequencies, less than 2%, in present day populations. To date, the number of individuals for whom genotype and phenotype information is available has been limited, making it difficult to study archaic alleles that are at such low frequencies or to link them to phenotypic variation. Also, uh, we have not had much in the way of uh, Neanderthal DNA in, uh, until recently. Um, as, you, as you will see, that becomes pretty important. A recent study used the electronic medical records and genotypes of 28,000 individuals to address the contribution of these less frequent Neanderthal alleles to clinical traits in modern humans. And of course, if you're doing that kind of a study, you're going to find the bad stuff easier, I think. Um, it showed that a large number of Neanderthal variants at different loci influence, a risk, influence risk of a number of disease traits, including depression, skin lesions, and blood clotting disorders, and that Neanderthals contributed both risk and protective alleles for these traits. So some of it's good, some of it's bad. But if you're looking at people who are sick, you're probably gonna find more bad ones. However, evaluating the broader contri contribution of Neanderthals to common phenotypic variation in modern humans or inferring Neanderthal phenotypes has not been possible largely because of the limited number of studies that collect genotype data together with common phenotype information. In other words, you had a medical record and the patient had, oh, well, Huntington's career or whatever. It doesn't say a word about whether the patient was tall, short, blonde, brunette, uh, any of that kind of stuff. In addition to collecting genotype, uh, genotype data via a custom genotyping array, the UK Biobank has collected baseline phenotypes, including traits related to physical appearance, diet, sun exposure, and behavior, as well as disease, for more than 500,000 people. The pilot data set included genotypes and phenotypes of more than 150,000 of the individuals was recently made available st for study. So there's a huge database. Some of it has more detailed information and they're gonna go off of that 150,000 individuals. Using this data, we studied the contribution of Neanderthals to common human phenotypic variation in 112,000. Why not use the whole 150 where we're gonna find out that 40,000 have been excluded and you'll see why. From the UK Biobank to determine the set of traits to which Neanderthals have contributed and to evaluate the relative contribution of archaic and non-archaic alleles to common phenotypic variation in modern human. I should probably note archaic just simply means what they think is Neanderthal, okay? Non-archaic means it came from somewhere else, who knows where. Maybe mutations, maybe... Some of it, uh, including the Neanderthal stuff, may be really archaic and go back to Adam, but they don't believe in Adam, so that, that hypothesis simply won't wash. Materials and methods. First, the data sets from the UK Biobank we obtained genotype, genotype and phenotype data from the pilot phrase of the UK Biobank project. Uh, genotypic in, genotype information for 152,000 individuals across 822,111 uh, genomic sites. So they have a whole bunch of data and a whole bunch of different sites that, that have been looked at. And of course, that's the easy part because you know doing DNA analysis nowadays is relatively easy. Then they filtering genotype data, so they didn't use the whole thing. Well, you notice that there was 150,000 people that were there, and we removed a total of 40,391 individuals. Of these, 480 were related according to a kinship inference analysis. In other words, they didn't want to count them twice, and so if you got 
you know, two sisters. Well, if you got two identical twin sisters, you really don't want them in, uh, except as one data point. Okay. Um, 17,308 had significantly decreased heterozygosity levels. Let me translate that for you. That means their parents were related to each other and they got a, they got a double dose of stuff. And so you're getting a, uh, uh, you're getting a biased sample. And 32,443 uh, were, had substantial non-European ancestry. So they're, you know, they came from Pakistan, India, uh, you know, places where the, the uh, British Empire used to rule and they moved to the mother country and then, uh, uh, or their parents did, or their grandparents, and uh, they're trying to get people who, whose ancestors were in Great Britain to begin with, uh, and not people who just moved there from who knows where, Africa somewhere. Annotating non-archaic and archaic like SNPs. Um, SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. That's an area on a gene where sometimes you have one nucleotide and sometimes you have another, which means usually that sometimes you have one amino acid and sometimes you have another, but not necessarily because it may be in the silent, or so-called silent area. It turns out those are not totally silent as well. Um, a total of 825,927 polymorphic sites were genotyped. We took a two-step approach to annotate SNPs on the basis of whether they carried an allele of putative archaic, archaic origin. How do you know it's really uh, Neanderthal DNA? Well, this is how you do it. First, we identified pro potentially introgressed alleles. That's stuff that could have come from the uh, uh, Neanderthals uh, by selecting SNPs that had one fixed allele in Yoruba individuals, that's an African population with little or no inferred Neanderthal DNA. Um, when, they, when they did that, they found that uh, Neanderthals basically didn't give any independent contribution to this particular tribe. So they're kind of the pure tribe, so to speak, okay? And a different allele in a heterozygous or homozygous state, it could be either one um, chromosome or both chromosomes that had the different nucleotide in that spot. Um, in the genome of the Altai Neanderthal, the Altai Neanderthal, what is that? That turns out to be a woman from Siberia, is a, or a female um, uh, who died um, 50,000 years ago. And because she was in Siberia, her bones stayed frozen pretty much all of the time. And so you could actually measure DNA in it. And everybody kind of agreed that you could. And so they got a nice DNA off of this, off of this specimen. That was the only specimen that they had for a long time. Because they didn't think you could get DNA from a Neanderthal otherwise. I'm saying that because now they have two specimens. Another one, also a female, interestingly enough, in Croatia from a cave. And so we're going to read that we have two separate, um, two separate uh, DNAs that they will sometimes compare things to. Now think of it as we have 50,000 people and our DNA from Neanderthals come from two specimens. That's not a very extensive um, 
DNA range to compare it to. You could say that this is the Altai Neanderthal in us rather than the Neanderthal. And you wouldn't be that far off. <clears throat> and that's segregated in any of the UK biobank individuals. We refer to these variants as archaic like SNPs. What that means is you had stuff that was in the, uh, in the Neanderthal, not in the African, and was in this particular bunch of uh, Europeans. And of course, some of that could have been re-mutations. That happens occasionally. And that's why they're not gonna say they're sure. They're gonna say archaic-like when they're being really technical. Sometimes they'll slip up and say archaic. They don't really know. But it's probable, I would have to say that. And you see, we refer to these variants as archaic-like because they, they think that it belongs. Now, there's some more details there. In the construction of this integration map, a number of criteria were used to ensure that the identified haplotypes were highly likely to be of introgressed origin. It really probably came from Neanderthals. One, alleles were required to be shared between non-Africans and Neanderthals, but not be present in sub-Saharan Africans, because otherwise you'd say, well, it's just human, right? Two, haplotype lengths had to be consistent with admixture about 50,000 years ago. Hmm. And what that means is I think that you cut down uh, uh, the lengths because for every time you have a uh, meiosis, you have crossover. And so some DNA from one, part of one chromosome will be from one parent and part of one chromosome will be from another parent. And uh, and you can calculate roughly what you expect, although the difference between 5,000 and 50,000 years probably isn't that much. There is probably a leveling effect in that particular regard. And three, haplotypes had to have a lower divergence to a Neanderthal reference genome than to African genomes. So it had to look more like Neanderthal than it did like this particular tribe in Africa that they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Moving along, uh, there's stuff about phenotype data and correlation of genotype and phenotype data. If you're interested, it's fascinating, but we'll never get through it all if we spend time on everything that you could get interested in. For both tests, we considered associations that reached P as less than 1.0 times 10 to the minus 8 as significant. I thought you usually used P equals uh, 0 0.05. Why? Well, there's actually a good reason for that. This addresses the multiple testing problem encountered when the f associations between 136 phenotypes and approximately 6,000 uh, SNPs are evaluated, family-wise error rate being 1.0 uh, times 10 to the minus 8 times 6,000 times uh, 136, so they're actually testing at the 0.01% uh, adjusted to the fact that you're doing so many of these. So they really require it to be pretty significant before they're going to say it probably exists. Phenotypic impact of archaic and non-archaic alleles and candidate gene analysis and marker mechanism. These are all still part of their protocol testing whether inferred archaic haplotypes exceed the length expected by incomplete lineage sorting. And, um, and then finally, haplotype trees for candidate loci. And in that, it says for each of the 13 inferred archaic haplotypes with significant phenotype associations, we extracted the genomic sequences of all 1,000 genomes phase three individuals as well as the genome sequence of the Altai Neanderthal, Denisovan, and chimpanzee. 
Rooted neighbor tree adjoining trees with chimpanzee as an outgroup were computed and are displayed in figure S1. And if you're interested, that's actually on, uh, available on the internet. Um, results, that's what you're really interested in, I think. The strongest association we found in this study was an archaic allele underrepresented among red-haired individuals. More than 20 variants in MC1R have been shown to alter hair color for in humans. None of the variants resulting in red hair in modern humans are present in either of the two high coverage Neanderthal genomes that had been sequenced. Well, of that, oh, that last sentence until it said the two that have been sequenced, I was ready to say good work, except for one thing. And by the way, some of those genomes, according to them, if, uh, uh, some of the genes that are in this particular area that's underrepresented do appear to be able to code for red hair. That's two Neanderthals. Count them, two. If we were to do this room here, I don't know how many red-haired individuals do we have? Or maybe I should say that used to be red-haired. Not too many, right? Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I that I would uh, that I would use two Neanderthals to to make that kind of a comment. Just statistically. I don't know why this particular thing. What's even weirder is that further down in the paragraph we read, further, a Neanderthal specific variant uh, postulated to reduce the activity of MC1R and result in red hair. In other words, this is a somewhat known uh, variant was identified by PCR amplification of MC1R in two Neanderthals. So they did find it in two other Neanderthals. Now that is what, two out of four? Well, I don't know how many there were uh, in those two. It would be nice to know if it was that two out of 18 or what, you know? However, this putative Neanderthal specific variant is also not present in the Neanderthals genomes that have been sequenced to date. Oh, all two of them, right? Suggesting that if this variant was present in Neanderthals, it was rare. I'm not sure that I could buy that, that it's any more rare than it is in present-day British people. This is science. It's peer-reviewed. You've got to believe it. What are you going to do about it, huh? Here's a... Just for what it's worth, here's the blonde, light brown, dark brown, black, red is quite a bit lower. But it's not horribly lower. There is some cross-reactivity. It's statistically significantly lower, just not absent. And I'm not sure what other means. But... Uh, I, I have observed too many humans with green hair. Um, we also identified strongly associated archaic alleles on two unlinked intergressed haplotypes near BCN2, BNC2, a gene that has previously been associated with skin pigmentation in Europeans. The first archaic haplotype is tagged by an archaic allele that has a frequency of more than 66% in European populations, very common, and is associated with increased incidence of childhood sunburn and poor tanning in the UK biobank cohort. Which, you know, Neanderthals are up north and don't get a lot of sunlight. It doesn't matter too much whether they burn. Maybe they get better vitamin D um, production that way. Now, so the Neanderthals were light-skinned. Well, 
And Neanderthal haplotype in this region was previously identified by Vernot and Aki, and the association with sun sensitivity is consistent with the previous finding that Neanderthal alleles on this haplotype result in an increasing risk of keratosis. You know, the actinic keratosis that you get from, or that some people get from sunlight. Um, all of the Neanderthal-like SNPs overlapping BCN2 in this haplotype have significant scores in a test for recent positive selection in Europeans, perhaps indicating their importance in recent lo local adaptation. You don't get rickets as often. Interestingly, however, a second less frequent archaic haplotype near BCN2 shows strong association with darker skin pigmentation in individuals with, Brit with British ancestry in the UK biobank cohort. So what happens if you have both of them? I guess you get average skin for a European anyway. Um, the apparent variation in the phenotype, phenotypic effects of Neanderthal alleles in this cohort demonstrates that it is difficult to confidently predict Neanderthal skin and hair color. It's a wash. We also found two archaic haplotypes that contributed significantly to differences in sleep patterns. Archaic alleles near ASB1 are associated with a preference for being an evening person and an increased tendency for daytime napping and narcolepsy, respectively. So if you find yourself wanting to nap in the middle of the day, that's your inner Neanderthal coming out. Um, Neanderthal alleles contributed to more variation in four behavioral phenotypes influencing sleep, mood, and slow smoking behavior, suggesting that Neanderthal alleles contributed more to these traits than expected from their frequency in modern humans. Conversely, for two associations, ease of skin tanning and pork intake, non-archaic alleles showed lower association p-values, indicating that intergress Neanderthal alleles contributed less than frequency match non-archaic alleles to these traits. So apparently Neanderthals don't eat pork, or didn't, I guess, or maybe they didn't like it as much, or something. I'm not, I'm not sure how genes determine your pork intake, unless you're Jewish, in which case I think it's more the customs than the, than the genes, but whatever. Uh, discussion. We found that skin and hair traits are overrepresented among these most significant associations with archaic alleles, at least among the stuff they looked for. However, when we compared the contributions of alleles of Neanderthal origin with contributions of alleles of modern human origin, we found that both archaic and non-archaic variants contributed equally to skin and hair phenotypes consistent with a neutral contribution from Neanderthals and with the idea that Neanderthals themselves were likely to be variable in respect to these traits, except for red hair, except for those two uh, PCR results. However, there are four phenotypes, all behavioral, to which Neanderthal alleles contribute more phenotypic variation than non-archaic alleles. Chronotype, that's when you do your best work, are you a night owl? Loneliness or isolation. Frequency of unenthusiasm or disinterest in the last two weeks. And smoking status. Of these, the significant association between a Neanderthal variant in ASB1 and preference for evening activity also showed a correlation between the Neanderthal allele frequency and latitude, suggesting a link to difference in sunlight exposure for this phenotype. Uh, that, this does not have to be that people are less adjusted and so they die or they don't have kids. It could be as simple as they're less adjusted and they feel better when they move down south and so they stay down south. And vice versa, that people who are uh, more adjusted um, uh, up north they go up there or less adjusted down south, whichever. Um, so you, uh, you may see some you know, movement selection as well as uh, traditional Darwinian selection. 
Multiple phenotypes significantly influenced by Neanderthal introgression have some link to sunlight exposure. Given that Neanderthals have inhabited Eurasia for more than 200,000 years, according to the conventional theory, they were most likely adapted to lower UVB levels and wider variation in sunlight duration than the early modern humans who arrived in Eurasia from Africa about 100,000 years ago. Skin and hair color, circadian rhythms and mood are all influenced by light exposure. We speculate that their identification in our analysis suggests that sun exposure might have shaped Neanderthal phenotypes and the gene flow into modern humans continues to contribute to variation in these traits today. Now, that's their conclusion. I think the data can only be regarded as preliminary at present. Uh, there is a massive database of modern DNA associated with modern traits, and I think it's good that they're exploring that. But there's only two high-quality Neanderthal genomes. To make that into all Neanderthals is really stretching it. Some lower quality data is apparently ignored when it is available, especially the one for red hair. So take what's said with a grain of salt. The data is being interpreted through an evolutionary lens. And you notice that it's, they're unapologetic about that. Uh, from their point of view, why creationism doesn't even exist. Um, Neanderthals reportedly died out some 50,000 years ago, and most people would say it's less than that. What would a change in that assumption do to the data? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, it would be interesting to rework that, saying it, the, um, the crossing over happened about 5,000 years ago instead of 50. You know, that kind of uh, reduction happened with mitochondrial Eve and people kind of ignored it. Did Neanderthals represent a pre-flood branch or a post-flood branch? I suspect post-flood, uh, but in that case, they were an early branch that probably did die out shortly after the flood. I mean, people went up and they didn't survive some winter and that was the end of them. Both Neanderthals sequence so far have been female, which is interesting. Um, I would like to know what the Y chromosome looked like when compared with modern humans. <laughs> I suspect that it's going to be very, very close and not nearly as far away as the, uh, uh, as the chimpanzee Y chromosome is. But that's, that's a research project that I think creationists would be much more enthusiastic about. Um, I think it's interesting to see, you know, there's, there's, there's the old earth hypothesis that God created all the species. And that God, when he, when he did the Garden of Eden and he created humanity, that was the end of the creation. Uh, well, Neanderthals being a different species from humans, it looks difficult to defend that hypothesis. Because apparently we interbred with them as far as we can tell. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Neanderthals apparently did not look that much different from modern humans, at least in skin color. Um, finally, one can notice the twisting of statistics inherent in evolutionary propaganda. Humans are 99% chimpanzee, or is it 98%, or 96%, or depends on how you count it. The 99% is the one that gets quoted all the time, or maybe 98, because it sounds so impressive. Um, I can tell you that for the human Y chromosome, it's less than 70%. And if you count the disorganization, it's probably less than 20%. But notice that humans are in the popular press, 2% Neanderthal. And yet, we can interbreed with Neanderthals, but not with chimpanzees. Something's wrong with this picture. Now, I'm going to say that 
it depends on how you want to count it. And if you go through the chimpanzee genome and you say, well, this one we can't find a match for, and this one we can't find a match for, and so there's a match, and then well, let's see what it's like. Well, when you do that, it's 99%. But that's kind of twisting statistics, right? I mean, all the stuff that, let's say, were duplicated, or were, um, or you couldn't find a match for, you didn't count at all. And that's really what's going on, is that it's probably something closer to, uh, uh, if you take the whole genome and just run it, it's probably something closer to about 90%. Uh, but, in fact, the Neanderthal genome is so close that they talk about single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs. You know what that means? What that means is that for a particular stretch of DNA, presumably an enzyme or something like that, which is what, uh, maybe 500 bases, something like that, you have one nucleotide difference. That's 99.67%, 8% maybe. What that means is, when you hear that we are 2% Neanderthal, they're, they're really not talking about 2%. They're really talking about 99.96%, but that, that, uh, that you can say that Neanderthal genomes and ours are different in enough ways to where you can distinguish the two. Now, why doesn't that get in? to the popular press. Well, I'll leave you to ponder that. You've heard my opinion, now it's your turn. Yes. Is this a case of acromegaly? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, I googled Neanderthal and this guy pops up all over. I, I don't know why. You will notice that he's holding a stone knife. <laughs> Is he left handed? Uh, he he kind of looks that way. He's holding it with his left hand. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. But you, you, but yeah, just just pop in, you know, Google Images and Neanderthal, and you'll see him all over. Yeah. They had brains larger than ours, so uh, the more Neanderthal I have, the prouder I am. Also, the the cerebellum is larger than ours, which means they're better coordinated, apparently. So. I, I don't think that's a cigar. If you look at it carefully in the original, no, I think that's a I think that's a stone knife with a wooden handle around it, which is, <laughs> which is uh, well actually the picture has nothing to do with the uh, with the article itself. I just I, I found the I found it and I thought it was a good illustration of your inner Neanderthal. <laughs> Uh, but just a minute. Let's uh, let's pick your comments up here. Is there a lot? Of, is this on? Yeah, it's on. Go ahead. Is there a lot of controversy between scientists on this issue? Uh, or is this? Uh, well, well the, it is now pretty well accepted that Neanderthals actually interbred with humans. Um, I would say with other humans, you know, and to, to say that they're like 99 plus percent human, uh, really, instead of the 90 percent that's been inflated to 99 percent in chimpanzees, um, I think, um, I think illustrates the point that, uh, 
that uh, <coughs> that what you see in those numbers is is inflation, but that when when people think about it on their own, they actually do agree that Neanderthals are closer to humans than than uh, than our chimpanzees. It's just that some people are trying to impress us with how close we are to chimpanzees and to impress us with how little we share DNA with Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. these numbers keep getting pulled up. Uh, comment here and comment there. Oh, and you, one for you too. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I quit teaching in 2004 and you would not have seen this illustration in the biology book at that time. I haven't kept up with it, but you saw the ape uh -huh. figure. Yeah, but uh, you see, you shave him, you put a suit on him, he, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, and then over, uh, and then Jack. We all have heard the word no Neanderthal, but none of us know very much about him. And uh, I have always wondered how they determined that they were a separate species and so forth. But what I really want to comment on is to the degree that we do know something about them is from pictures, and like one, what we're looking at right now. Uh, the skulls are very coarse looking. Uh, they, look, they look more suggestively like chimpanzees than they do humans, and therefore like some black skulls. And yet all of this, all of this data that you're talking about has to do with whether they have red hair, whether they have more likely to be, whether they're more likely to, to um, tan or not tan, or whether they sleep late. Now what the what has that got to do with <laughs> what we're looking at up there? A rather uh, thick-lipped looking, big-jawed person. I don't see, really see the connection, but then of course we're not looking at, uh, at all these g genetic studies, but uh, you're, leaving with us, you're leaving me with a huge gap. <laughs> well, you, you'll have to say that it's less of a gap than it was for the other kinds of pictures you can pull up under Neanderthal. Well, he has a nice blue suit. Yeah. But, I mean, he, if you look at him, he looks human. Of course, it probably was actually. Well, marginally. No. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> but whether or not he looks human, what has that got to do with how Lady sleeps? Th that's true. That's true. <clears throat> And the truth of the matter is, we are making guesses because we don't really know which genes make you or encourage you to be a night owl. And maybe how you were trained has more to do with it than, than what your genes say. And so, you know, you take all of this stuff with a grain of salt. It also has to do with your age, believe me. <laughs> okay, Jack. Um, you referred to evidence of interbreeding between humans and Neanderthals. I came in late. Maybe you covered it earlier. Is there evidence for that? Yes. Of what sort? Uh, of the sort that if you compare uh, different groups of humans, in this particular case specifically Yoruba tribe in Africa, versus the average uh, British Isles person. Uh, I mean, you, you have to start somewhere, and that's where they started because sure. that's where the data is. Um, that uh, although most of the time our DNA is more closely related to the Yorubas, there are some areas where our DNA is more closely related to the Neanderthal DNA that we do have in one and now two specimens. And the D, uh, then it is the, the DNA in the Yorubas. And that's been quantified by mm, sort of non-firm but suggestive data uh, to be about 2%. 
well, just listening to what I heard when I came in, <clears throat> it seemed like if there were an agenda, it would be to minimize evidence for interbreeding between Neanderthals and humans. Yeah. Because there seems to be an agenda to, to connect us more closely to other uh, to other organisms, other the chimps or whatever. I, I think you're right. That clearly is an agenda. Yes. Other than evidence. And it raises the interesting question, maybe we really should be considering ourselves more like about 10% uh, or something like that, and we just selected stuff that uh, that happens to fit. I, I don't think the researchers started out trying to prove that. I may be wrong. Um, but I think that eventually it did kind of, um, and now that that marker has been laid down, if you get a new study and it says we're more like 50%, that study, we meaning Europeans, not necessarily all humans, um, that, um, uh, boy, that, um, sorry, my brain is getting old and I lose track of things. I'm way ahead of you. <laughs> uh, that, uh, let's start over again, if, 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 we, if we get a new study and it says that it's really more like 20%, then they're going to look for ways to kind of minimize it because otherwise it disagrees with the previously reported literature. And that means that your lab isn't really very good because you can't get the results everybody else does. <laughs> Although what we'll find out next week is that if you can't get the results that everybody else does, it doesn't necessarily mean that your lab is bad. It may mean that the other guy's lab is bad. Well, of course, that is always going to come from a, a lab that wants to be better than you. True. Um, there were, Errol, you mentioned something about brain capacity in Neanderthal, Neanderthals uh, comparatively. Uh, brain size, pardon me. Here, let me, let's get a conversation here. Go ahead, Ariel. Yeah, so it's it's larger than larger than human. Significantly, is uh, is there a noticeable difference in the sizes of the cranium that surround the cerebral hemispheres? The where cerebral are the, hemispheres where are, the are roughly the same. The most of the extra area is in the cerebellum. At least that that's the information well, I have. That certainly makes sense. Uh, they better based coordinate. On, on a, based on a general picture of brain sizes of brain areas versus uh, yeah. physical and. and but I think it's fair to say the cerebral hemispheres are not smaller, and they may be slightly larger. Well, it, that again suggests to me tremendous. Uh, let's say in science, sometimes you want an outcome and you design towards it. True. Rather than taking the so-called good science, where yes. you leave it an open question, get the best metrics you can. You you may be right. You know, one of the things is they they have not actually found cerebellums in those brains. They're having to do that on the basis of where they think the fox lies. Well, and, the, uh, and they could be they could be wrong in those measurements. The morphology of the cranium around the cerebellum would certainly be insightful. Yeah. No, I, I, I think I think that you can reasonably look at it that way. It may very well be though that you can look at it the other way too, and um, and that they actually had bigger brains than us, and the people just didn't want to say that. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, it's it. it Having seen this, this sort of thinking over a very long period of time, uh, suggest with all the things that have just come out that I am just getting refreshed on, there certainly is an agenda to connect yep. us to other apes rather than other more human-like uh, organisms. 
And that's all I have to uh, say. I think it was Upton Sinclair who said that uh, it's very difficult to get a man to understand something when his livelihood depends on his not understanding it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you think about it, and, and you go against the grain, whether the grain is theoretical or other people's findings, and if other people's findings support the theory, it gets very difficult, uh, then the next time you apply for a grant, you'll be lower on the totem pole. I may have mentioned once before, in a, in a paper that was central to the work we were doing, uh, reviewed uh, the, and I'm reading between the lines, a relatively uninformed uh, evolutionist who didn't seem to have a lot of neuroscience background uh, interpreted my data in the following way. If you can't give me a, an interpretation that fits with my pre-existing ideas I don't believe your data yes and that is a problem and in fact we're going to see the reverse of that problem that if you give me an interpretation that fits with my, uh, my preconceived ideas that then you're publishable and you should publish now uh, <laughs> we're going to see that next week right. on what, RNA world that's what keeps paradigms going false paradigms going yeah uh, but uh, what I just wanted to comment about it, for some unknown reason, I, I don't know why so much uh, in Europe especially, I have picked up such a strong prejudice against Neanderthal. I mean, it, it's a horrible, it's a horrible thing if you associate with Neanderthals, it's an insult. Well, of course, you um, Neanderthal. <laughs> but uh, these these were apparently uh, more human than uh, some of us at least behave. Uh, uh, they buried their dead. And they put flowers with their dead. Uh, they were quite uh, understanding people. Yeah, and and their cave paintings are fantastic. And if you think about the way they did it with, you know apparently no ability to do, you know, uh, pencil drawings first to make sure that it came out okay. Uh, it's amazing how well they did. Uh, or at least some of them did. So yeah, uh, Neanderthal should not be an insult. But, but you are moody and, and you like to smoke so you're a Neanderthal. Uh, that, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so many of the findings today refer to these uh, bones being humanoid, but not human, and not Neanderthal, but other humanoid species that lived for a while and then vanished from the sea. Where do we stand on that kind of theory? Uh, well, I'll tell you, the uh, problem is starting to solve itself with more data. And maybe I can say more honesty. Um, there, there was a cave, and uh, I'll have to bring this to your attention, or maybe if we have a competent anthropologist, I'll hand it over to you. Um, there was a cave where they found D Denisovans, or Denisovans, whatever they are, and Neanderthals and uh, some other uh, proto-human, supposedly, um, all living together and people with varying uh, mixtures of this, which suggests that they're all one and the same. It just depends on, uh, you know, which uh, which person you're talking about that, you know, some people got bigger jaws and whatever, you know, and uh, it's, it's what we have now. Uh, except that, you know, we've narrowed into a smaller subset, so to speak. But that in fact, the, the ancients were, uh, uh, they were mixtures of various kinds of data. It, 
it's going to be interesting to see what happens when people finally tumble to the fact that you can DNA sequence all of these and then they start working on that one cave where everybody lived happily together and looks like they you know had children together and whatever and they're all doing fine uh, and so and so the old picture of well you had this little camp here and you had this little camp here and they're all split off from the branches well no not necessarily and it looks like they're all and, and if we've interbred with Neanderthals, or at least the East Asians and the Europeans of us, um, then that means that uh, uh, we're all part of that family too. So the whole idea of splitting this off into, you know, pre-humans, they're not pre-human, they're just different humans, that's all. Comment here. Um, I'm convinced that this guy, I'm Mike, this guy is Mike, yeah. Mike. Yeah. intentionally I didn't <laughs> want to put it there. <laughs> <laughs> I think this guy is a distant cousin of all of our previous governors. <laughs> 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 um, would you then yeah. say that perhaps? Adam had the genes that sure. really the Neanderthals and the other folk had the same sure. genes? Sure. Uh, I'd go further and I'd say probably Noah did too. Because, I mean, the, 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 they're human beings. Yeah. Yes. That's the bottom line. Yeah. You see, it's not the Filtrum man. I mean, that, that was a total hoax. Yeah, but this is different. Yeah, no, this is not an orangutan that's been carved to be a human. These are just different humans. Right. And if they were alive today, they could marry whoever they wanted to and, and wanted to marry them and have kids and they'd be fine. No, the, the skull that you showed, uh, the posterior area of the skull looking different, well, all of our skulls are different here, right here. Yeah. So it just happened to be one of these skulls that they have the Neanderthal that looks different. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, as has been pointed out, the brain case is actually slightly larger. Uh, it's debatable as whether the cerebrum was larger. Maybe these guys were as talented or most, as Mozart. Maybe he didn't use the right pillow, so it <laughs> formed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, come back next week and we will talk about the uh, RNA world advance that wasn't. <laughs>